So ever since we started sailing, I've had it in my head that I really, really want to cross an ocean, but now that we've sold no. Satori, the only way to do so is on someone else's boat. Problem is, I've never done ocean crossing before, and that's exactly the type of experience that boat owners are looking for. Additionally, I promised Connor that I would go back to work at the end of this year if I can't get this channel going more, and finally, I only have a short window in which I can actually do the crossing in the first place. As I watched boat after boat after boat leave to go to Fiji, my options began to dwindle. I started to lose hope that I would ever tick this item off my bucket list. Little did I know that this is going to turn out way better than I expected. But let's back up a bit. It was February 2022 and I'd just gotten off Captain Mark's boat from episode 1 of the season. I was feeling inspired and I was creating a bucket list of sails I wanted to do. But... I knew I didn't have enough experience for an ocean crossing, and there would be a long list of potential crew with way more experience than myself, who I would be competing with. I was intimidated, but I was way more determined. So I started doing some research, I made a plan, and I started working towards an ocean crossing. But I only had a two month window in which I could make this crossing happen. You see, I had bought a ticket to go home to the US at the end of June, but boats don't start leaving New Zealand until early May, which means I only had a two month window and as any sailor knows, you cannot sail to a schedule. Weather will always win. Side note, bad weather can be avoided in many cases with good planning, but for longer crossings like I was hoping to make, there was a chance I would get caught in an unforeseen storm. This is insane! But as I've mentioned before, it's waves that sink boats, not wind, though wind does cause the buildup of waves. According to several studies done around the world, there are three conditions to waves that usually have to exist to sink a boat in bad weather. One, the weather is usually approaching the boat side on. Two, the wave is breaking. And three, the wave is over 30% of the boat's length. But here is where it gets interesting. Ever heard of the roll of seven or less? According to these same studies, if the swell period is seven times or less than the wave's height, it is only then that the wave will break. You have a 40 foot boat, which means the boat is unlikely to be knocked down until the seas become 12 feet or more. But following the roll of seven or less, as long as the swell period is 84 feet or more, the wave is unlikely to break and it takes much bigger waves than that to pitch pull a boat. So yeah, you can't sail to a schedule. I needed to make a plan to get on a boat sooner than later so I'd have plenty of time. Hey, Daniela. Hello, hello. <laughs> so you're looking for a boat? Yeah, what, what are you looking for in a captain? Well, the more like experienced they are, the more comfortable I feel. And the, the there was what one or two captains that I've been on their boats where they aren't super experienced, and you can kind of like feel their nervousness when they don't know what's going to happen. Whereas like someone like Captain Mark, like he was super comfortable on a boat, so that made it really easy. Like when we were in big waves, I felt really comfortable with him. So wave miles experience—that's the biggest thing. The first part of my plan was to build up my experience, but having been a captain and owned my own boat myself, I had a ton of experience already. Fixing engines, keeping crews safe, coping with big waves. But I was missing one key piece of the puzzle. Being at sea would be potentially two weeks, and I'd only ever done one overnight sail. I am still feeling like poop. My sister with two young kids said this might be a comparable experience. Imagine you've had a sick toddler for one week and you haven't gotten any sleep and then the principal of a school hands you the keys to a giant school bus and tells you to drive a bunch of kids across a one lane bridge with no sides, it's swinging. Now jumping on a boat for two weeks with only one overnight experience is the equivalent of doing that but having never been around children. Now, as you guys know, if you watched the last episode, at the same time, I was also getting a bunch of shit on YouTube from my viewers. Oh, but not you, lovely. You're absolutely darling. Thank you so much for watching. The theme was, don't sail. And if I'm completely honest, it was intense and very overwhelming. But as my nomad friends out there will completely understand, when you follow the dream, there's a lot of people telling you, you can't, you shouldn't, you will regret it. Don't go, I wouldn't, it's gonna be shit. So I needed to get back on a boat. And what better way than to jump on a boat from Wellington to Auckland, which would take about three days.
If you watched episodes 8 through 10 in this season, you will know that not only were we forced to make multiple overnight stops, but I didn't even make it to Auckland. It's an abrupt ending, mm -hmm. but that happens. And I didn't have time for another sailing trip. I needed to edit a few videos for when I was home in the US. So with an application that would barely compete with the numerous other sailors trying to find a boat, the only other option was to market the hell out of myself. I would just like to thank the United States government for letting me take out tens of thousands of dollars in loans for my master's degree. I just knew one day that it would help me go sailing and I'm just so grateful. Thank you guys so much. One day I'll pay it off, maybe before I die. Mmm, debt for the next 20 years of my life and now I'm trying to be a YouTube sailing channel, right? But I have taken a few important lessons from my degree. Like how to manifest something that seems incredibly intimidating how to overcome odds, and how to make people want to hire me for a job. But rather than go through all the details about how I made myself presentable and marketable, if you have any interest in learning about this stuff, I was thinking about hosting a little workshop. So there's a link that's gonna be popping up right around here, or I'll put a link in the description where you can express your interest and then maybe I'll organize something, we'll see. What are you gonna do if you can't find a captain or a boat? Well, if I can't find a captain, I'll just steal a boat. And if I can't find a boat, I'll just steal a boat and scout them. No, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, <you'll laughs> Ride people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might not be able to go. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So I can look at the end of the season, though, again. Are there lots of other crew out there looking for boats? Uh, yes. There's, I think, a list of at least 50 people on island cruising. And then, like, all over Facebook, people are posting as well. And... Yeah. Now this is where the awkward gets very, very high. Now that I had an application and a short bio typed up, I needed to do something that a lot of people really, really, really hate. I needed to put my application everywhere, on every page, every Facebook group, every website, over and over and over and over again. Sorry guys. I actually got a ton of interest and I interviewed with a ton of captains, but it wasn't actually the interest I was looking for. Let me tell you about three scenarios that happened to me. All right, scenario number one. It's a 45 foot catamaran and it's got three queen size bed berths, which is absolutely amazing. Except that they wanted to bring in four unpaid crew and two of the crew would be on watch while two of the crew would be off watch and they would be rotating so it would always be two sleeping, two on watch. But they'd be sharing one bed because the other bed was full of all of their stuff. Which means for two weeks straight we'd be sharing one set of sheets rotating all the time. And as if it was a as if that was not gross enough, then the captain starts complaining about being woken up by crew because apparently there was some container ship which was headed towards their boat. Rule number one, a captain should never complain about being woken up because A, it's either a legitimate concern or B, it's an illegitimate concern and the captain or the crew is too inexperienced to understand that, which means either way your life is at risk. Scenario number two, a 50 foot monohull. The monohull was on the hard, so the guy needed help finishing up a bunch of boat projects before he could take the boat offshore. And he asked me if I could help. And I told him, I'm sorry, I can't help that much because I have to edit a bunch of videos before I go back to the US. So rather than telling me that this would not be okay, he couldn't accept me as crew, he starts telling me these stories about other crew members who he ended up dropping because they wouldn't do the boat jobs. But it wasn't even the story that got me. It was the way he talked about the crew and it just came across as privileged and entitled and presumptuous and honestly my gut feeling was like nah this is not gonna be pleasant. 24 hours a day, two weeks to this person, no way, not happening. And scenario number three. This one was the most disappointing because they were actually super cool. It was an older couple and they wanted me to come on their boat to potentially help ease the load. But they ended up getting a major issue that they needed to repair last minute. And as I looked back on the situation retrospectively, they were quite a new couple and you have no idea how that's gonna go, right? They're still figuring out their boundaries and they're still figuring out how things are gonna work. And in the end, I'm kinda glad that it didn't work out. So what are captains looking for in crew? What are they asking you? Um, <laughs> maybe this is a me problem, but I'm asking way more questions than they are. Um, they always ask about seasickness, like, do you get seasick? Um, which luckily I don't yet. I got a little bit queasy down in the quick cook straight, but even then I didn't puke or anything like that. 
and that's pretty much it. But I think that's mostly because I'm on YouTube. So a lot of people have been watching like the sales that I've already done because they know my experience. So I don't know what they would normally ask. But you can go on Crew Seekers. They've got a members page and you can go there and they'll have all the list of questions. So. Oh, hello there. I see you looking at my shirt. You like it? Connor has one. Oh, and my sister has one. And my patron John has one. If you want to get yours, you can go ahead and get one. Support the channel. Several interviews later, the self-doubt started to kick in. I started to ask myself, am I being too picky? Maybe my gut feeling is wrong about that 50 foot model haul. Maybe it'd be okay to share a bed with three other people? Am I ever gonna cross an ocean? If I can't find a boat to make movies about, how am I gonna keep this channel going? Despite the self-doubt, I was determined. As my timeline got smaller and smaller as my flight home to the US approached, I just pushed harder and harder. I reached out to everyone in my network. And this is where months of professionalism paid off. Every single interaction that I have in the sailing community, I treat with professionalism. Every single time I got on another person's boat, I always represent the crew and the captain respectfully. And every single time I partner with another sailing business, I always give them veto rights. And I've actually changed things in videos to make sure that they are represented the way that they want to be. And I always support a fellow business owner when I can. And so, I got a message. Pick me, pick me. Oh God, please pick me, pick me, pick me. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Pick me, pick me, pick me. The pressure was on. A paid delivery with the owner? Oh, tell me please, how do you stay professional while puking over the side? Am I even a real sailor? What if the captain finds out I bought this jacket specifically for this interview? What if something really bad happens to see you like Pat? What if they never want to hire me ever again? Does the owner know I'll be filming myself? It was go time. I perfected my resume, I doubled down on my interview questions, and I researched the hell out of this crossing. But one thing that I will never do is I will never exaggerate my experience because the last thing that I want is to be at sea dealing with an emergency that I said I was good at and have no idea what to do. Literally my worst nightmare. So what's more difficult? Um Owning and sailing your own boat or finding another boat to sail on? Oh, definitely owning your own boat. Crewing is way better than owning a boat, guys. Let me tell you this now. Crewing is so much better. <laughs> I want to do a video about this at some point, but crewing is definitely better. So now that you've uh, crewed on a couple of boats, is it getting easier to find boats to crew on? Yeah, I think being a woman helps a lot. Like, a lot. Every captain that I've talked to so far, they prefer women. And some of the boats, they will only have women. And they just don't want to have male crew so i kind of feel bad for guys for that and then of course like youtube like everyone wants to be on camera that well not everyone a lot of people don't want to be on camera specifically but there's a lot of people who do want to be on camera or they're looking for like um this free movie made from their experience so that makes it a lot easier and then i like to think i'm a pretty good crew member i contribute well i'm considerate and i have some pretty good references that are helping me out so i think i have it easier than most people so when I finally got that call from Captain Peter, I let him know both my strengths and my weaknesses. Just over a week later, I got this message. I was going to Fiji as hired crew. 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 <laughs> Alright guys, if you like this episode, go ahead and watch this one right here where I go into my top 10 anchorages in New Zealand and while I'm telling you that story, I give you a bit of background about both Connor and myself. And also in two weeks, I'll put the video right here where I stay a little Fiji.